Today we are going to destroy the works of the devil. Here's a article on my website, BibleBookProfiler.com, Shield of the Trinity, Deciphered and Exposed. Look at the second half of 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The Son of God is Jesus Christ. When we get born again, we have Christ in us, the hope of glory, so we can destroy the works of the devil too. Hello everybody, this is Mark Paxton with BibleBookProfiler.com and today we are going to go over the crucifixion of Jesus Christ like you've never seen it before. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe if you believe this video will help somebody. Besides Hurricane Laura that hit Louisiana recently in August of 2020, which insurance companies usually falsely call the acts of God, the works of the devil are most prevalent in the form of the commandments, doctrines, and traditions of men which cancel out the word of God. The teaching that God forsook Jesus on the cross actually is a doctrine of devils. I'm going to show you how to prove that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross from multiple objective authorities. We need to eliminate personal opinions, denominational bias, and complex and confusing theological theories. So here is the article on my website on the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We're going to be focusing on Matthew 27:46. How to prove God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. So here's the introduction. I'm not quite finished with the article yet, but we're, we've got lots of in-depth, detailed stuff that you have probably never heard before. I got links to different sections of the article. You can jump right to it. The majority of the teachings on the crucifixion of Jesus contradicts the word of God. Now the relevant verse for that is Ephesians 6, 16 in the context of the spiritual competition. Above all, taking the shield of faith which is believing wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. A fiery dart of the wicked is an image or word that contradicts the word of God and has devil spirit power behind it. Okay? We are no longer a soldier of the Lord like people were in the Old Testament and gospel period. We are athletes of the spirit. We are athletes of God. A radically different approach. We can win in the spiritual competition if we stay strong on the Word of God and have the rightly divided Word to receive with meekness, to retain with conviction, and release with boldness. So, here's some examples of fiery darts of the wicked in relationship to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The traditional teaching is that only two were crucified with Jesus Christ, but the evidence for four crucified is irrefutable. So we're going to go to this article very briefly. I'll do a complete video on this another time. But here... We need to highlight some of these things because this is very important. This is called the felony forgery of John 1918 and the four crucified with Jesus Christ. 
Forgery is a felony crime which is the unauthorized tampering of an important document. A companion felony crime, which always goes with it, is fraud, the deliberate attempt to deceive. Deception takes the form of lies, which originate from the devil, who is the originator of lies. If you resort to committing two felony crimes to prove your point, then your point is invalid. So, let's dig into the depth of this by going to this image of five crosses. These are located at Plubesri, France, to verify that the idea of four crucified with Jesus isn't new. These stone crosses were made sometime in the 18th century. I've linked this geographical location to Google Maps. So you can click on this, go down into the street view, and verify it yourself. You can zoom out and see that it is in France. It's a pretty cool little trip to take. Now, let's get to the depth of this. If we, the sons of God, cannot put the pieces of the Bible together correctly, then how can anybody else? Look at Nehemiah 8.8. 8. So they read in the book in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. See that? It is the distinction in the details that make all the difference in the world. So if we can't even count to four correctly in the Bible, then what else are we missing? It's a harsh question, but it's a valid question. If you're being taught there was only two crucified with Jesus Christ, what else are you not being taught? What else are you being taught that's wrong? John 1918, King James Version, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side one and Jesus in the midst. So that verse clearly says there's two crucified with Jesus. I can count, right? There's one bad guy on one side of Jesus, another bad guy on the other side of Jesus. One plus one equals two. But that's what King James says. That's not what the word, rightly divided word of God says. And how do I know that? Again, we're not interested in my opinion or complex, confusing theological theories or denominational bias. We want multiple objective authorities. So let's go and check this out. This is why we need to do biblical research from multiple objective authorities. How do the ancient biblical manuscripts render John 19.18? Here is a screenshot from a Greek interlinear of the felony forgery of John 19.18 where the translators deliberately added the word one to this verse. The word interlinear comes from the prefix inter, between, and linear, lines, and refers to a the same block of text but in different languages in alternating lines. So here is a Greek interlinear of John 1918 from a Greek manuscript dating somewhere around the 15th or 16th century. So you've got the lines of Greek text, and then translated over into English text, and then you've got the English line right next to it. Now, there's a big red box. Notice that the word one is in square brackets, which indicates that it was purposely added to the Bible. That is why there is a blank space above the word one and no corresponding Greek word above it. So look at that. 
right here. Here's John 19, 18, where him they crucified, and with them others too, on this side and on that side, one, moreover, Jesus between. But look at this. That word one is in square brackets, and there's no corresponding Greek word above it. There's a blank space. See that? There's the Greek words above the English words throughout the rest of the verse, except for here. And the word one is in square brackets. Now, the King James translator should have done one of two things. The best way would have been to leave that word one out completely. On the other hand, they could have left that word one in, but put it in italics text, which is what they're supposed to be doing whenever they add words to the Bible. Sometimes the italicized text makes sense because of the differences in the languages, but many, many times it's inaccurate. It's simply their opinion of what words in English should be added in there to make the allow the verse to make sense. But they did this deliberately. They deliberately and wrongly taught something that contradicts the Bible. They did not put that word one in italics text. And they really should have left it out completely. So, when you read this accurately, there's two on this side and on that side. You see that? So, you got two criminals on one side of Jesus and two criminals on the other side. So, two plus two equals four. So, now you can say, well, what if this Greek text is wrong? That's a valid question. Sometimes they are. Sometimes they're not. Usually, they're much more accurate than any modern version. That's why we got to go back as far as we can to the most ancient Greek and Hebrew and Latin and Syriac and these other languages. Go back as far as we can, as close to the original Word of God as possible. So that's why we go to multiple objective authorities. So let's see this for ourselves. Here's a screenshot of the Codex Sinaiticus, the oldest complete copy of the Greek New Testament in existence, dating back to the 4th century. So it carries a lot of weight. And all of these are free resources available to anybody with online access. So here's verse 18, and it says, Where they crucified him, and with him two others on this side and on that side, but Jesus in the midst. So there you have it. That corroborates this other Greek manuscript. So now you've got a solid piece of information. But there's more. Here's eight critical Greek texts. And I put the important Greek words in a red rectangular box here. So you can see it in all these Greek manuscripts. So we got more cooperation. So again, two generic criminals, malefactors on one side, plus two robbers on the other side equals four criminals crucified with Jesus Christ. You got to look up the definitions of the Greek words. Now let's look at a diagram. This is why there can't be only two crucified with Jesus Christ. Here's the diagram of the traditional teaching of two crucified with Jesus. 
The Roman soldiers came in, broke the legs of the first criminal. That made them die faster because they had to uh, get these guys off the cross by sundown, which is when in the Hebrew culture they changed days right around sunset. So they broke this guy's legs, went right by Jesus Christ, broke the second criminal's legs, and then they come back to Jesus and go, Oh my God, he's dead already. We can't break his legs now. Because that fulfilled an Old Testament prophecy. And this makes Christianity look like an idiot. It's crazy. But look at the integrity and precision and sound logic of the rightly divided word of God. You got four crucified with Jesus. The Roman soldiers come in here, break the legs of the robber. The lestai is the Greek word. Then they go break the legs of the next criminal, which is a malefactor. The Greek word is kakorgoi. Then they get to Jesus and see, wow, he's dead already. We can't break his legs. See how simple and logical that is? How about that? So, when you research the Word of God, you got to use critical thinking skills and understand the principles of how the Bible interprets itself. You got to watch the passage of events, the passage of time, the geographical locations, the definition of these various Greek words involved in the situation. See, so you got the robbers and the thieves. See, the, the word thieves in King James is actually robbers in the Greek text. And the malefactors is just a, a gen, generic criminal. See, it's a different Greek word there. You got to look up the word others. Now, here's another thing. The cross was a stake. Everybody has seen jillions of crosses all over the place in cemeteries in churches, posters of the crucifixion, etc. Our entire culture is saturated with them. What most people don't realize is the actual cross that Jesus Christ was crucified on was not the traditional cross we're all familiar with, but was, in fact, more like a telephone pole. Look at this screenshot of the definition of the cross on page 819 from E.W. Bollinger's Critical Lexicon and Concordance to the Greek, to the English and Greek New Testament, published by Zondervan. Here it is. The staros, that's the Greek word, was simply an upright pale or stake to which the Romans nailed those who were thus said to be crucified. Here's a variation of the word staros, it's the verb that merely means to drive stakes. It never means two pieces of wood joining each other at any angle. Even the Latin word crux means a mere stake. The initial letter X, chai, of Christos, Christ, was anciently used for his name until it was displaced by the capital T, the initial of the pagan god Tammuz, about the end of the 4th century. You see that? Very important stuff here. So now, that is just a brief definition and overview of the four crucified with Jesus Christ. What's another fiery dart of the wicked in relationship to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? Number two, Jesus died on Good Friday afternoon and was resurrected Sunday morning. But the Bible says he was in the grave 72 hours. So, nobody can cram 72 hours between Friday afternoon, 3 p.m., 
and Sunday morning. It's impossible. It's mathematically impossible. So again, if you really think about it, it makes Christianity look like an idiot. It destroys the credibility and trustworthiness of God and His Word. It's actually a contradiction. So, what do you do? Ultimately, you have to trash, eliminate the commandments, doctrines, and traditions of men and just think logically according to the integrity and precision of the Word of God and change our thinking to the Word and not to the traditions, commandments, and doctrines of men. What actually happened was Jesus Christ was crucified on Wednesday afternoon. 72 hours later brings you to Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening. Then when everybody went to his grave early Sunday morning, he was gone already. That fits with the diagram, with all the Greek words, and all the rest of the information on the four crucified with Jesus Christ and everything else regarding the crucifixion of Jesus. So again, we must go with the Word of God and not the commandments, doctrines, and traditions of men. So today, we're going to handle that teaching that God forsook Jesus on the cross. Look at Matthew 15, 6. Thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. The commandments, doctrines, and traditions of men get us out of fellowship with God. They contradict the word. They are fiery darts of the wicked. And they remove the beneficial effect of the word in our lives. It corrupts the word of God. The way Matthew 27, 46 was mistranslated was a spiritual crime against God, His Son Jesus Christ, and all who have heard this abominable teaching that God abandoned His perfect and only Son on the cross. I call it an Easter crime because on Easter Sunday morning, everybody teaches that there was two crucified that he died on Friday and got up Sunday morning, that God forsook him on the cross, all kinds of stuff contradicts the word. It makes Christianity look like it has no precision, logic, or integrity. If you are having great trouble understanding Matthew twenty-seven forty-six, then heave a sigh of joyous relief. You will soon have the answer that also fits the characteristics of God's wisdom in James 3, which is peaceful, gentle, easy to be entreated, and full of good, good fruits, among others. There's eight great characteristics of God's wisdom, which you're gonna, we're gonna go into later. You will be able to verify the truth of God's word yourself from multiple objective authorities imparting great confidence, strength, joy, and peace. So that's what you're going to be able to do by the time we finish this whole video series. Now, one of the ways the Bible interprets itself, a very important concept there, the Bible interprets itself, is when you have a group of verses on any given subject, all of them must be in harmony and agreement. If a few seem to contradict the vast majority of clear verses, you must research the few problematic verses to see how they fit in with the rest instead of building an entire erroneous doctrine around the few which is handling the Word of God deceitfully. But yet that's what Christianity has done they have ignored all the simple, clear verses about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and built an entire erroneous and false doctrine 
that God forsook Jesus on the cross. There is one other verse that is similar to Matthew 27, 46, and that is Mark 15, 34. So we will just focus on Matthew 27, 46 and see how to prove that God never forsook Jesus on the cross. So what does Matthew 27, 46 actually say? This is the King James Version, but it doesn't really matter what version you read because they all fundamentally say the same thing. That's the modern Bible versions. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The idea that God forsook Jesus hanging on the cross has been with us for many centuries, yet it contradicts many other verses in the Bible and the very nature of God himself. So, how do we solve this problem? Well, we got to do biblical research and follow the sound principles of biblical research and critical thinking skills. So, how do the ancient biblical manuscripts render Matthew 27:46? Check out this screenshot of the Lamb's Bible translated from the 5th century Aramaic Peshitta text. And by the way, Aramaic was the native language of Jesus Christ himself. Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, Eli, Eli, lamana sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, for this was I kept. You see that? It's radically different and has a radically different effect than the modern versions that say that God forsook Jesus on the cross. Earlier, we read Nehemiah 8.8, 8, which emphasized the fact that they taught the word of God distinctly. Look at this. In this Aramaic manuscript, it says Lamana, but in King James Version, it says Lama. See that? That one tiny difference makes all the difference between truth and error. There is no word Lama in the Aramaic, but there is the word Lamana. You got to translate it correctly. This is what the Word of God says right here. My God, my God, for this was I kept. Jesus Christ was carrying out the will of his Father. Now let's check some other manuscripts out. Let's see how the Afrikaans Peshetta text translates Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Yeshua cried out with a loud voice saying, My mighty God, my mighty God, why do you still spare me? Continue it. And it references Psalm 22, which is going to be the subject of another video on the same subject of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 22, they made the same mistake there as they did in Matthew 27. In other words, they mistranslated it. But if you go back to the Aramaic, it says the same thing. It says that he was spared. He was kept. And then there's also a figure of speech in there that further explains and elucidates it. And then furthermore, you got to look at the context. The context of that verse verifies again that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. So those are some of the principles of how the Bible interprets itself. You got to go to multiple ancient biblical manuscripts. 
You got to make sure it's translated correctly. You got to look at the context because the context is one of the ways the Bible interprets itself. Here's a third screenshot that testifies of the precision of God's word by an ancient Peshitta English interlinear of Matthew 27:46. So there's the second time we're using an interlinear. You got to know what biblical research tools to use in order to rightly divide the word of God. And you can see the big red bolded text. Now this is, there's verse 45. Here's verse 46. And this language you read from right to left, not left to right. So in the red letters it says, My God, my God, why have you spared me? See that? Now I've translated that for you right here in verse 45 and verse 46. Now from the sixth hour, twelve noon, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour, 3 p.m. Not Friday, Wednesday. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice and said, My God, my God, why have you spared me? Look at these three points. Now all the confusion, contradictions, and mental anguish instantly disappear. 1 Corinthians 14 says that God is not the author of confusion. James 3 in reference to the wisdom of the world, which is earthly, sensual, and devilish, says that where there is envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. When it comes to Bible contradictions, there are no true, actual contradictions in the original Bible, the original God-breathed Word. If it appears to have contradictions, if the Bible appears to contradict itself, the answers are in two areas. There's either a mistranslation of the text, which is very common, or it could be a deliberate forgery either way, or there's a misunderstanding of the text. And that's very common also. A misunderstanding of the text comes from false information and lack of information. Many times, figures of speech is the key on how the Bible interprets itself. Understanding the Hebrew culture many times is the key to understanding Bible verses. Understanding geography, many other things. So when you have the correct and complete information, you'll have the correct and complete understanding of the rightly divided Word of God. Now, Matthew twenty-seven forty-six and Mark fifteen thirty-four fit together perfectly with the rest of the Bible. Now, the Bible makes sense, which goes way beyond understanding the superficial information, because when the Bible is a simple, logical book that makes sense, we can trust in it. We can rely on it. We can live for God according to the word of God. Now, we're going to go into some in-depth stuff here. What do the scriptures say about Jesus being forsaken and the wisdom of God? All right, now hypothetically, you could have Professor A from Seminary A, and he says, God forsook Jesus on the cross. But he could be arguing with Professor B from Seminary B. And he says, God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. And so they argue back and forth and back and forth, and just have envy and strife and confusion and every evil work. Because the average person like you and me is 
we have our heads messed up because these equally intelligent, equally educated theologians arguing over the same verse and yet come up with totally opposite conclusions. So if the experts can't agree on what the Bible says and what it means, then how can the average person? That's a very logical question. And that's why we have to go to multiple objective authorities. We don't want personal opinions. We don't want denominational bias. We don't want complex and confusing theological theories. So, how do you solve this problem? The wisdom of God is the mediator in this situation. People can argue over Matthew 27, 46 all day long. But God, in his foreknowledge, knew Satan would corrupt this verse. He knew it would cause conflicts. He knew it would cause confusion. He knew what was going to happen. So, God put a system of checks and balances in the Word so that we could verify and establish the rightly divided Word of God. The way we do that is to go back into the Old Testament. Nehemiah 9 and Ezra 9. We're going to read through these, break them down, and put it back together again. We're going to go over a lot of stuff that may seem off topic, but the Word of God deals with everything that pertains to life and godliness. We are in some very wicked times. Look at the news. All the riots, the virus, all the corruption, the love of money. We could go on and on and on about all the darkness and lies and corruption in this world. We need the Word of God now more than ever. So that's why we have to go back to the wisdom of God and the Word of God to bring us life, to bring us health, to bring us prosperity, to bring us all the light and love and goodness of God. So there's a lot of lessons in here that we all need, even if it doesn't directly deal with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. It's all related though. It's all indirectly related. So Nehemiah 9 verse 16 But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments and refused to obey. Neither were mindful of thy wonders that thou didst among them but hardened their necks and in their rebellion appointed a captain to return to their bondage. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and forsookest them not. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf and said, this is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt and had wrought great provocations. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light the way herein they should go. Nevertheless, verse 31, For thy great mercy's sake thou didst not utterly consume them, 
nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. How about that? So now, we're going to dig into the depth of this and go through the other chapter 9 of Ezra. And we're going to put this all together and it will be a incredible conclusion and verification of the truth that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. But they and our fathers dealt proudly. So that's one thing we need to deal with. This kind of pride here is ungodly pride. Nothing wrong with building a house and being proud that you did a great job. That's one thing. This pride here is ungodly pride. It is pride in excess, pride to extreme. And the Word of God says where there's pride, there's destruction and a fall. So, but they and, and our fathers dealt proudly, hardened their necks, and hearken not to thy commandments. They refused the commandments. And look at this. And refused to obey. Neither were mindful of thy works that thou didst among them. Refused to obey. What's going on there? Okay, so I need to close that window. Let's go to Galatians 3. This is BibleGateway.com, a great website to go to for many different things. They've got the Bible in many different versions, and they've got an audio Bible and lots of other resources, so it's real good to go here and uh, read the Word. A lot of times I'll put the audio on, and I can hear the Word, while I'm doing other things and make my time more efficient. Galatians chapter 3, King James Version, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. See that? There's no wisdom of God there. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you? Now, when you want to find out about an event, there's all those different questions like who, what, when, where, why, and how, right? Which one of those questions is God asking us? Not where were you bewitched or how were you bewitched, but who bewitched you? And what is bewitching? Bewitching involves the operation of devil spirits. It's devil spirit power. And where did that come from? Ultimately, it originated from the devil who worked through his own children who have sold out to him and taught the Galatians false doctrines. In other words, the commandments, doctrines, and traditions of men that cancel out the Word of God. Things like the two crucified, Jesus dying on Friday and getting up on Sunday, God forsaking Jesus on the cross. Those are the doctrines of devils they were teaching them. And what is the consequence? What is the result? Who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? See that? Look at verse 3. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? He called them foolish twice. And that's what happened to these people back in Nehemiah's time. They refused to obey. They were spiritually bewitched. They were influenced by devil spirits. And that's what got them all screwed up and against God. Neither were mindful of thy wonders which thou didst among them. God did perform wonders 
amongst them in spite of all their darkness. But yet, they were not even thankful to God for what God did for them. But harden their necks and in their rebellion, see, it was just outright rebellion, appointed a captain to return to their bondage. See, they didn't disobey God out of ignorance. They disobeyed God out of rebellion, out of defiance. A major difference. And appointed a captain to return to their bondage. No person in their right mind is going to return to bondage. They were in bondage. God brought them out of that bondage. And then they got trapped into bondage again. And speaking of bondage, in the King James Version, that word bondage is used six times in the book of Galatians more than any other book in the New Testament. And that bondage was in the form of legalism. Bondage and legalism go hand in hand. And see, this goes way beyond being in bondage, like, you know, in handcuffs or being in prison or something like that. There is a devil spirit of bondage. There are approximately three dozen categories of devil spirits. One of them is a bondage spirit that binds you up and prevents you from doing the word, from obeying the word of God. That's why they refused to obey. They were influenced by a bondage spirit. But there were a lot of other devil spirits involved too. Deceiving spirits, lying spirits, spirit of whoredoms to cause them to worship other gods. They were in a big, dark mess. But thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and for forsookest them not. Look at that. So even though they were screwed up to the max, operating devil spirits, and idolatry, which we'll get to in a minute, God did not forsake them. Yea, when they had made them a molten calf, and said, This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt, and had wrought great provocations. And when I first read that, I thought, wrought great provocations. Well, well, that's wonderful. God's doing some great work here, right? Wrong. See, that's why you can't go by your own opinion. You can't just read some version of the Bible and jump to a conclusion and think that's the original God-breathed word. You can't think that that is the truth until you verify it for yourself. Do some research. Do some homework. Do some critical thinking skills. And then you can say with all the authority of God, Thus saith the Lord. That word provocations comes from the Hebrew word Nitzah, Strong's number 500, 5007b, and it means blasphemies and contempt. Look at that. Look how they, look what their attitude was against God. They, viewed God with contempt. They viewed God's word with contempt. How many atheists have that attitude because of wrong teaching from the word of God? And it got to the point where they spoke blasphemies against God. That's all from false doctrines of devils. And what a waste of resources. Look what Satan, the adversary, inspired them to do, to make a molten calf. This wasn't a little half-ounce trinket in their hand. This was a massive chunk of metal, of gold, silver, valuable metals. And they said, 
This is thy God that brought thee up out of Egypt. They honestly believed that this chunk of metal they made was a God. Why would they do that? Were they insane? Probably so. Why? Because of devil spirit influence, devil spirit possession. They had a spirit of error. They had spirit of lying. There was deceiving spirits, all kinds of devil spirits. That's what happens when you get into idolatry. Idolatry is a magnet for devil spirits. God want, the one true God wants worship and the devil wants worship. And the devil got to him. But we're not done yet. See this molten calf and idolatry and material things comes to mind another very relevant verse in Acts 19. I told you we were going to cover a lot of other things here. But this is life and these are lessons of life that we all need to learn and relearn and be reminded of. Acts 19, King James Version, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. And there's a, a very powerful event there that happened. And look at this. Verse 17. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus. And fear, that means respect, ah, that's King James Old English, fell on them and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Look at that. See, Ephesus had the great goddess Diana, a big statue, and they worshipped Diana. It brought in a lot of devil spirits. The word Diana in the Greek is also uh, called Artemis. And a lot of, lot of people worshipped her and that brought in devil spirits. And many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. They were all like-minded. So what did they do? They burned all their Ouija boards, their tarot cards, their crystal balls, stuff used in seances, in the worship of the goddess Diana, etc., why did they do that? To get rid of devil spirit influence. Some material objects can attract devil spirits. And look at the perfect order. They burned the objects first, got rid of the devil spirits, they shut the door that the devil had into their lives, and then, 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 the word, of might, the word of God mightily grew and prevailed. You see that? You got to recognize the darkness first, kick it out, and then the word of God can grow. It's like Yoda said, hard to see the dark side is. Well, of course, it's logical. You can't see the dark side if you're in darkness. So what do you do? You have to turn on the light of God, the perfectly pure light of God, and the light of God dispels the darkness. And then the word of God will grow and prevail in your life when you have the light of God. The darkness is Jesus being forsaken by God. The darkness is the two crucified. The darkness is Jesus dying on Friday and getting up Sunday morning. That's the 
dark commandments, doctrines, and traditions of men that steal the word of God out of your heart. But the light of God will help us. In Ephesians, it talks about walking in love, which energizes our believing so that we can see the light of God and then walk circumspectly with the wisdom of God so that we are not blindsided by the adversary. I can tell you a personal experience with this. Many years ago, my apartment was pretty messy. And one day I woke up and decided I really need to get this cleaned up and organized. I went to Walmart. I bought a new bookshelf, gathered all the books scattered all over my apartment and put them into one bookshelf. And just that alone made a big difference because the Word of God in 1 Corinthians 14 says, Let all things be done decently, appropriately, and in order. We have a God of order, a God of light. So I got all these books organized. Then I started going through them and wondering, well, what's this book about? Is this book beneficial to me or is it detrimental? Do I read this book? Do I need this book? And I came upon a book. It was a self-help book from my sister. She meant well. She didn't know what was going on. She was an unbeliever and still is. But she meant well. She gave me this self-help book. I think it had the word um, uh, warrior in it. And right in the preface, the author came right out and said that 100% of that book was inspired by spirit guides. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh, that's a big red flag, spiritually speaking. So then I randomly read a few paragraphs throughout the book. Some of them had bits and pieces of true or correct information. But the majority of it was false. The majority of it contradicted the word of God. Now, so just so you know, spirit guides is just a way to hide the devil. Spirit guides are devil spirits whose sole purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. So this is what we're doing here today. We are destroying the works of the adversary, the works of the devil, which most often takes the form of the doctrines, commandments, and traditions of men. So I took that book and I shredded every single page. There was like 150 to 200 of them. And then I shredded the paper, the the whole cover because it was a paperback book. And the next day, I noticed that my whole apartment was spiritually lighter and brighter and I started understanding and seeing different verses of the Bible and it was a whole new awakening. I was like, wow, that's incredible. And so you got to be careful with what kinds of objects you bring into your home, what kind of objects you keep in your home. Some things are godly, some things are not. Some things can bring in devil spirits and mess you up. And many, many times, devilish objects are in the form of religious artifacts. Because the devil is a master counterfeiter. And many things, his best, the devil's best counterfeits are in a religious context. So be sharp, be strong, and make wise decisions on the Word of God. So now we go back to Nehemiah 9. So the adversary tricked him into wasting all the resources and making this stupid molten calf. All right. Now, verse 19. Yet thou in thy manifold mercies forsookest them not in the wilderness. That's the second time God says he will, he did not forsake them. And it says they were in the wilderness. 
That's very important. If you look up the definition of the word wilderness in a dictionary, it has two root words, wild, beast. There's two categories of wilderness. There's the physical wilderness and a spiritual wilderness. In the physical wilderness, you could be out there by yourself in the wilderness and have to face a wild beast like a, a lion, a tiger, or a bear, or a cobra. Nobody wants to be in that situation. It can be dangerous and even deadly, right? Nobody wants to be lost in the wilderness with the deadly wild beast uh, facing them. But that is also true spiritually. There is a spiritual wilderness. The book of Isaiah mentions this. And it says, The devil made the world a wilderness. It's a spiritual wilderness. That's why this world is so screwed up. It's so crazy. It's so full of lies and confusion and darkness and error and wars and suicide and murder and famine, chronic diseases, hate, fear. There's 10,000 negatives out there because the devil has made the world a spiritual wilderness. But look what God does. Because of His grace, because of His mercies, even in, for these screwed up people in the Old Testament, the pillar of the cloud departed not from them by day to lead them in the way, neither the pillar of fire by night to show them light. See that light is there again and the way wherein they should go. God led them in the way. Jesus Christ is the true and living way. He is mentioned in every single book of the Bible. The Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. That is the true and living way. Look at this. God told the Israelites through the prophet Nehemiah, not once, not twice, but three times in only one chapter, that he would not forsake them, despite all their idolatry and hardness of heart and all of their other sins. On top of that, he freely gave them many good things as well. Read the whole chapter. That's the kind of God I want to worship, is a God that's got my back no matter what. The devil won't do that to his kids. The devil will murder them whenever he gets a chance if it's to his advantage. Now look at Ezra 9, verse 6, and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God. For our iniquities are increased over our head, and our trespass is grown up into the heavens. Look how deep into idolatry they are. Since the days of our fathers, we have been in a great trespass unto this day. And for our iniquities we have, our kings and our priests have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword to the captivity and to spoil and to confusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace has been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in his holy place that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. Look at that. Verse 9, For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, and to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah 
and in Jerusalem. Look at that. So no matter how dark your life may be, the light of God is always available if you want to get revived and get out of your bondage. And see that your life will turn around when you have a conscience, when you can honestly say that you screwed up, that you were tricked by the adversary, and you want to come back to God. We've all been there. It just takes some meekness, some humbleness, some wisdom, and spiritual maturity to admit, to see that we were in darkness, and now we can ask for forgiveness, and God will shine His perfectly pure light into our lives and lead us out of the darkness. He will lead us out of the bondage. See, in the Old Testament, people were sons of God by adoption. They were not sons of God by birth. Look what God did for them as a son of God that was adopted. So what can he do for us as a son of God by birth? We have far more than what these people in the Old Testament had. Yet, God never forsook them in their bondage, in their idolatry, in their darkness, in their rebellion. Our God did not forsake them. Now we start to wrap up and get the final answer. In Ezra 9, God did not even forsake the Israelites when they were in bondage after their iniquities are increased over our head and their trespass is grown up into the heavens. So how could God have forsaken Jesus Christ who always did God's will and never sinned? It's a very important question. So now we go to the answer in James 3.17 The Wisdom of God This solves the arguing professor's problem. Right here, This the Wisdom of God is the mediator that will solve this problem about whether God forsook Jesus Christ or not. But the wisdom that is from above, not below, not from the earth, above is first, pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, full of good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. Look at number seven. Without partiality. Number seven in the Bible means spiritual perfection. God is spiritually perfect. His wisdom is spiritually perfect. What's another word for partiality? Bias and favoritism. Now, let's zoom out from the Old Testament Include the New Testament and look at this whole situation. If God forsook his perfect son Jesus, but did not forsake the Israelites who sinned in the max, then God is guilty of partiality of the worst kind, which contradicts his own wisdom that is without partiality. You see that? How could God forsake His perfect Son, Jesus Christ, who always did His Father's will, and 
whom God says multiple times in the Bible that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, how could God forsake him and not these Israelites that were into idolatry and bondage and darkness and rebellion and everything else? He can't do it. It contradicts his word because if he abandoned his son and did not abandon the Israelites who sinned to the max, then he would be guilty of partiality. He would be guilty of favoritism. He would be showing favoritism to the Old Testament sinners and not to his own son who was perfect. So think about that, people. you got to go to the Word of God, apply the wisdom of God, and we will get our answer. Okay? The answer is right here in the wisdom of God. Look at this. And there's other verses that back this up. Many verses. Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. No respecter of persons means to treat all people in the same way. How about that? We have a God of justice, of fairness, and consistent love. So look at that. Acts 10.34 Of a truth, not the false doctrines of men, of the truth from God, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. He didn't treat these people differently. So how about that? The wisdom of God solves that problem in one fell swoop. Look at this. That problem of whether God forsook Jesus or not. It completely bypasses the translation of Matthew twenty-seven forty-six and proves absolutely that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. Because if it did, if he contradicted his own wisdom, then that would make him a hypocrite, which also contradicts the word of God. You see this, people? This is the true light of God right here. And speaking of the crucifixion, I found another verse. Luke 20, 23, 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost, which is a very bad translation. He gave up his soul, which is his breath life. Now, we need to do some more biblical research because this is going to verify and clarify some other truths that corroborate what we just covered. Two critical word definitions for Father and Command. So, let's take a look at that. This is BibleHub.com. I'm on Luke 23:46, the lexicon right here. And Jesus crying out with a loud voice said, Father, into, thy, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said thus, he breathed his last. He took his last, last breath. Let's look at the word Father. See that word Father comes first. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He gave up his life. The word Father comes from the Greek word pater. It's probably where we get the English word paternal. And look at this. It's Strong's number 3962 a father. Look at this critical definition. Here's Helps Word Studies in Strong's Concordance. Father, Heavenly Father, Ancestor, Elder, Senior. Look at this third paragraph definition. Let me blow this up here for a minute. Make sure we can read it. The third paragraph, pater, father, refers to a begetter, originator, progenitor, one in, quote, 
intimate connection and relationship, unquote. You see that? Even hanging on the cross, carrying out his Father's will, Jesus Christ was in intimate connection and relationship with God his Father. That destroys the lie from the devil that God forsook Jesus Christ on the cross. Right there, one fell swoop. You see that? We're getting this cooperation from multiple objective authorities. We got the three ancient manuscripts of Matthew 27, 46. We've got the wisdom of God. We got that verse that God is not a respecter of persons. Now we got the definition of the word father. Now let's look at the definition of the word commit. Strong's number 3908. Paratithemi. To place beside, to set before. To set, especially a meal, before, to serve. Bring forward, quote as evidence, and trust to. It comes from these two words, Greek words, it's broken down. Para, right close beside. You see that? Blow it up bigger so we can see it. Para means right close beside. And to theme, to place, to put properly, to set close beside, right next to, figuratively, and trust, commit to in a very up close and personal way. Note the force of the prefix para. You see that? Very up close and personal, right close beside. That corroborates the definition of father, intimate connection and relationship. You see that? The doctrines, commandments, and traditions of man contradict the word of God. It steals the word out of our hearts. So there you have it. Irrefutable proof that God never forsook his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. How many more verses do we need? Now, when you look back at Nehemiah 9 and Ezra 9, there's some interesting numbers here. Between those two sections of Scripture, the word bondage and captivity is mentioned five times. The mercy of God is mentioned five times. He told the Old Testament believers that they were not forsaken four times. God's grace is mentioned three times. The light of God is mentioned twice. Reviving them is mentioned two times. Look what God has done for us, people. We got to go through the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus Christ taught that we should go by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So when we combine the truth of these Old Testament, or rather um, ancient biblical manuscripts of Matthew 27:46. And you combine that with these Old Testament scriptures of Nehemiah 9 and Ezra 9. And the wisdom of God and the nature of God of where it says God is no respecter of persons. We can verify absolutely positively that God did not forsake Jesus on the cross. So go through it yourself. Research it yourself and come up with your own conclusion. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's much, much more in the following sections, which I'm going to do in another video. God bless. Amen.